Hi, it's Steve Harkadon, and we are live with our second Alternative Education Film Festival interview. Kevin Solon is here to talk about his film, The War on Kids. Kevin, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. And Pat Faringa, co-chair of the Homeschool Plus Conference, my co-chair is here as well. Yeah. Thanks, Pat, for being here. My pleasure. Okay, Kevin, so I had a really interesting experience watching this film. Uh, I was so stunned by the last, like, four minutes of the movie. I couldn't move afterwards. I, I just sort of sat there uh, teary-eyed uh, in some, some, somewhat in shock. Uh, how are people respond? How have people responded to the movie? And, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who's had that response. Um, sorry, got my cat here. Uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, one of, one of the things that happens whenever there's a, a public screening of, of the movie, I get people coming up to me, and everyone tells me their own personal horror story of, of injustice uh, from when they were in school, uh, either something that directly happened to them or something that uh, that, that happened to someone else. And it, it becomes a very cathartic emotional experience. I think a lot of people... Um, you know, when, once you distance yourself from the school experience, um, there are certain things you remember, and there, there is, you know, a lot of people just remember the community that they had. And remember, you know, that they were surrounded by their friends, and they think about um, that, and, and school sort of has a, a positive, um, some positive feelings uh, based on on those associations, and um, and and it's one thing I I, I think about that in terms of uh, I, I was reading the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, and he talks about uh, when he had, uh, I guess it was his third attempt of escaping slavery, where he was actually successful. And he made it to New York City, and he's, it's, it's raining, and it's cold, and he's alone. And, and I guess that's the worst of it. I mean, he's just desperately alone on top of the physical discomfort. That's It's that, that psychic and, and emotional discomfort of, of profound loneliness. And and he was thinking about, you know, when, at least when he was a slave, there was this, there was community. And, you know, and it's horrible, and, and there's, there's nothing defensible about slavery, but, but the fact that, that there's this community there that was missing on, on a certain level is something that, that couldn't, you know, could never be crushed and taken away. And I think um, the film serves as a, a reminder of all the horrible aspects of school that have been suppressed and forgotten. Um, and, and where where only that that, that, that element of, of community you know kind of remains, but that's really not sufficient. And so I, I think it, it does have this emotional uh, impact on a lot of people when they watch it, and they're reminded of uh, a lot of the horrors that they endured that they've, they've kind of forgotten, even if it isn't you know quite you know the same as some of the things that are being depicted. Because I think um, there's there's certainly a, a more uh, you know, the, the, the desire to be more oppressive uh, is something, uh, you know, that has, that has resulted in, in recent years. And, and it's that phenomena that I'm, that I'm documenting. But at the same time, uh, I think there's, there's a great fallacy uh, to think that there once was a golden age of schooling. And I know that even some of my interview subjects, you know, seem to, would, would be inclined to think that there, there was or might have been um, there seems to be, in my research, no no evidence of that or that, and there can't be based on based on how it's designed and structured. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin, go ahead, Pat. Um, you made the movie, I know, three or four years ago, I guess, is when it, when it was released. Yeah. And it, you know, I mean, I'm always struck by by the incredible disrespect that that you know you see the children enduring in in that film, and now it seems. I mean, I know that that you know in your bio you say that you know you you've gone on to Harvard School of Education, you're your research assistant, and so on. There, do you think things are, are, are have gotten better for for children since you made the movie? Be better in in, in school, in, in uh, based on your you know knowledge of schools by working at Harvard now. Um, I I do think there's there are some that there actually have been some differences. I think. I, I think there that kids have, uh, you know, a few more options as far as with online learning, and I think that that the 
you know, charter schools and things like that. I'm not defending charter schools or anything like that, but what I'm saying is I, I think the whole notion of, you know, because charter schools are, are, the, are the same, they're identical, but, but it's, it's this, this concept that there are actually other possibilities, I think, has entered the dialogue that was never there before. And, and even, if, even if those alternatives are not yet meaningful, or at least some of them aren't, uh, I think it has legitimized the meaningful uh, alternatives that had been, um, you know, sort of dismissed. Right. I, I, think, I think people take homeschooling and unschooling much more seriously than they ever did before. And I think that, um, that that's been legitimized by the, the people who have been exercising, you know, with their, you know, using their feet to, to show, you know, their, their, their discontent with, with school systems. Um, how that's impacted kids' lives exactly um, in school, I, I, I don't think, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's hard to say that, that things have really gotten better new. I mean, one of the things... You know, I, I've noticed is is uh, whenever there was like a scenario at the ed schools for how to uh, um, you know tr implement or conceive of some new policy or approach to something, you know, the knee jerk response was always you know, throw a test at it. You know, we got you know testing, testing, testing. So so even even here where where people are supposed to be coming up with you know different approaches or something, it's mm -hmm. you know, now that you know it's it's you know when when you know every uh, when your only tool is a hammer, every problem resembles a nail. Well, you know, right. it's, it's it's testing has now been been so ingrained, and and, and many of the people you know at, at the ed school are, are teachers, uh -huh. and so so as much as they don't like testing, their imagination has been so crushed that right. they can't foresee alternatives. And I, I certainly would throw things out there, um, but one one of the things um, that I uh, you know, I'm working on on a paper right now is uh, has to do with uh, segregation, and, and and again, I I you know I, I, I like to go back to um, you know sort of the model of, of injustice, you know, which is slavery, and to to look at components of, of slavery and what made slavery so you know uh, humiliating and demeaning, just such a horrible evil system. And one one of the things, one of the components is, is segregation and. And Martin Luther King certainly speaks, you know, a lot about it. Well, well, children are segregated uh, when when they're rounded up and placed in school, and and segregation itself results in the creation of an underclass, and it results in the the attitudes that people have towards children, where they're perpetually infantilized. I mean, they're infantilized up into the age of eighteen, which is you know, there's there's <laughs> which which is so absurd. There isn't any. I mean, I understand from the uh, which you know, I don't necessarily agree, but I understand. From a pragmatic point of view, why laws have to be created in, in certain ways, you know, for social efficiency. It's not necessarily good, but it's it's pragmatic on some level. Uh, you know, again, I'm not defending it, uh, but it it results in you know, but but all of the things that Martin Luther King complained about, the, the impact and effects of segregation are are you know seen with, with kids, and it's it's certainly you know the the basis for for ageism and and why. People uh, despise and are able to get away with their resentment of, of kids and treating kids in, in certain ways, while at the same time claiming, you know, through you know, just lying through the teeth that uh, you know everything we do is is done to protect the you know kids. It's it's, it's, it's certainly not true, but I, I think so. So because of this segregation, getting back to the question, uh, things can't get better for for kids because there's always going to be that mentality that's that's created, and that's not the only component, but it is a significant one that I think is overlooked. Uh, that will always result in, in, in you know, youth being uh, demeaned and infantilized. So, Kevin, the, the scene at the end that was so hard for me was the little uh, black girl, well dressed, who had to be primary age, primary school age. Who's getting put into handcuffs? Yeah. Did, what's the backstory there? Uh, the backstory to that was that she's uh, a six-year-old girl who uh, she had been acting, you know, she had been acting out, throwing a temper tantrum, uh, and uh, the, uh, the 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 teacher came over and and picked her up somewhat forcibly, and I guess in the process, uh, the girl kicked the teacher, 
and uh, the teacher then you know called the police and had the police come in and uh, you know the, while the girl you know, after she was picked up she was placed in a uh, uh, you know in a holding you know in a in a room in the school where where then the, the police came to, to hand you know, so she's already calm and she's already in the room and, and was you know sealed off and has calmed down at that point but you know but the police have already been called in because she she kicked the teacher in the process of having this this tantrum uh, it's certainly not. That's not even the worst of, of stories that I've read of kids, kids being handcuffed and, and taken off to uh, to prison. Uh, there was uh, one. I mean, I've got a whole list, and, and uh, you know, ones that come to mind was uh, uh, one girl who uh, wrote, uh, you know, put you know some graffiti on her uh, on her on her desk, was taken away. But that the, the, I think the most egregious was this one girl who. Uh, was considered being disrespectful to a school administrator, and the police were called in and, and to take her away. One one of the things that I I, I would love for someone to do is uh, an analysis of um, it, it. Just seems, and this is anecdotal. I haven't really done this, but it seems under a certain age, uh, like below the age of twelve, it seems that it's it's more often girls that are arrested, and then I think after you know twelve, it's more often boys, but um, it's it's just sort of interesting that, that it seems like there is a gender imbalance uh, there, but I I don't know for a fact. It just uh, just from from cursory, but but yeah, the reasons people are taking you know this one just happened to be you know caught on camera, but you know many of the others aren't on, on camera. You know, sort of like the uh, the Stratford uh, you know uh, footage in Goose Creek, uh, South Carolina, where the uh, the SWAT team was called in because the principal thought that there might be drug use going on. Uh, in the school, and no drugs were found, but all the kids were forced to lie down at gunpoint while dogs, you know, you know these giant drug drug sniffing dogs came in and 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 you know searched them and their bags and, and everything and, and found nothing. Um, and, and, and if I remember correctly, the uh, parent parent didn't protest about that, right? They supported the principal in that action. Well, there was the principal did end up getting fired. I will say that, but the overwhelming support there there were supporters of the students, but they were in the, they were in the distinct minority. The overwhelming support was for the principal uh, for taking this action because kids should know the dangers of of drugs. Uh, you know, Even though it was a complete false positive. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. but 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 my point was like that was on camera, but you know who knows if. Other schools and how many other schools that kind of thing goes on where there aren't cameras. Probably not too many because there are you know now because there are cameras in just about every school. But you know at that time there weren't there weren't as many. Um, you know people took the wrong lesson from Columbine. Which I, you know in Columbine Columbine had cameras before the uh, you know the massacre took place and no one you know questions well, were were the cameras you know a one of many you know components there as far as you know, instilling and creating and driving paranoia. Uh, instead, they're like, "Oh, we must put cameras in all the schools, even though you know you can watch all the camera footage on YouTube if you want the, you know, the mm -hmm. massacres." Mm -hmm. So you do this brilliant piece in the movie, Kevin, where you 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 switch back and forth between prisons and schools, and then you have yeah. a <laughs> which is a person which is a school. I kept wanting you to go into the prison pipeline issue. Right, the sort of the for-profit prison motive, uh, profit motive, and then I mean, and I think this is probably after the film, but there was a judge who was found to have been taking a kickbacks from the prisons to be putting kids in the prisons. In Pennsylvania, well, two judges yeah. in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you know, and more, I, I was asked to write a piece. You know, the ACLU came to me and asked me to write a piece about the school to prison pipeline on the anniversary of. Uh, uh, Brown versus Board of Ed, and uh, you know, and this is just my, you know, a dig at the ACLU, but they they ended up not printing my my piece after they asked me to write it, because uh, I I said the problem isn't the school to prison pipeline, the problem is the community to school pipeline, and hmm. you know, it's schools are prisons, and they're just preparing kids for you know, mm -hmm. from there. Um, a, a lot is being said about the already. I, you know, one, one of the things that I wanted to do in my film was, was to, to 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 not uh, go to places where people would expect. You know, and and 
there, there is stuff talking about the school to prison, but and and there is a lot of there's a lot of talk also about uh, and, and and none of these things. I'm not criticizing you. These are totally uh, very appreciated that people are doing this, but also there's uh, a lot of discussion about about the injustices of race, and, um, which are are absolutely positively you know a, you know a you know out there. Uh, I wanted to show that the problems with school are endemic to school itself, and that if you if you're going in thinking, oh yeah, you know, this is this is unfortunate. Minorities are are treated you know poorly. We need to empower the minority community. Well, then you're completely missing the point of the film, and and you're missing the point of what's really going on in schools. That that schools you know are are oppressive, uh, you know, institutions that are not constructive to anyone who attends, and just because certain people are already in positions where they are going to succeed in some, you know, mean, you know, depending on how you define succeed, but they're, you know, they're going to be the beneficiaries of wealth, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. Regardless of whether they go to this institution or not, doesn't mean that the institution is not destructive. Uh, you know, most people think that it works for them. It's not. They, they were, these people are going to, you know, uh, prosper regardless. Um, so it, it's it, you know so I, I I really wanted to and tried to minimize you know these things that people have already seen discussed and, and expected you know you know issues of, of you know the, the poor treatment of race issues of um, you know like you said this the school to prison pipeline you know that's that's out there people people know that already and, mm -hmm. and then the, this is this is a story people don't really you know many people obviously there's many in, in the uh, you know, in the homeschool and unschool community that, that, that are aware of this. Uh, but in, in mainstream, uh, most people have this, re this, this reverence for school, and, you know, that's part of the dialogue. You know, we need a good education, thinking, you know, you need to go to school. You know, if you're going to succeed, you've got to go to school. You know, school is the answer to everything, and um, it's, it's not. It, it reinforces mm -hmm. the status quo. And uh, it's, you know, that's... What I was trying to accomplish in the film. Mm -hmm. One of the things that that really impressed me too about the the, the film was that history teacher. Um, I forget his name. But you, you use him throughout the movie. Yes, yes. And you know, I'm always amazed at like men like him and women like him who like s clearly see what's going on, yet stay there to try and help. You know, do the best they can. What happened to him after the film? Well, <laughs> uh, at one point, you know, in the interview, and I, I guess, you know, didn't make it, you know, into the into the edit, but I, I said to him, you know, after, you know, because, you know, he, exactly like you said, he, he came in um, thinking that he, he could help and, and would help, and, and he, was, he, would tell, he told me all these, these heart-wrenching stories. I mean, I remember this one story he told me about this one student who was just having such a, a, hard, a horrible, horrible time of things, because... Things were really bad at home, and uh, this one teacher, you know, came up and put his, his hand on his on his shoulder. And at that instant, he realized that in, in his however many years of teaching, this was the first time he ever saw anyone emotionally reach out, you know, and, wow. and offer support. So, you know, so this was a good moment, but it was, it, but it, it, it highlighted the fact that, that that had never happened before. And and he was saying, you know, talking about all all the kids in his class, and that he, he just gave up trying to teach them because they were so so beaten that he just would try to create his classroom as as sort of a respite from from the rest of of the school, and that kids could just kind of put their head on their desk and lie down, and you know that he couldn't, you know, he learned what he could and couldn't do. He couldn't take the kids out of the classroom because the uh, everyone was predisposed to think that learning can only take place in the classroom, right. and that if he tried to take the kids out. That, that the parents would be going to be an uproar uh, among the parents, and uh, you know, so so he could do anything he wanted so long as the kids stayed in the classroom and the kids showed up to take the tests. Hmm. Um, and and so he, you know, he he realized that 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 uh, you know he wasn't, you know, that that despite even that, that he still was participating in harming students. So I said to him, and I, I was just like, yeah, I didn't mean it in a cruel way, but I, you know, it was just based on what he was saying. I said. How do you sleep at night? <laughs> I know. And, and, he said, and he thought about it. He said, "I just try to take the approach like like a doctor who has the Hippocratic oath." And he said, "He said I try to do as little harm. You know, try to do right. 
harm or no harm. And he said, but at the end of the day, I know I'm doing harm. And then it was maybe a month or two after the interview that he, he died. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and he ended up starting his own, uh, his own, you know, I don't want to say school, but his own, uh, you know, uh, educational environment. Uh-huh. That, that that did become popular and uh, was you know was was you know in keeping with with, with, with a constructive vision. Um, and, yeah. yeah, but yeah, very good to him. So, yeah. so I felt mad at first, like yeah, oh, man, I'm responsible for this guy having a crisis of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but it seems like it, it's it's worked out for him. He's a great person. That's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really enjoyed that you had. Uh, thoughtful adult voices, but in some ways it was interesting to hear those students that you caught. Uh, were they Columbine students on the, in the park bench? Were they were you not able to go into the school? Was that why you interviewed a set of students outside? Yeah, yeah, that, so that, that was, yeah, they were, they were Columbine students, and um, I, I didn't, you know, it's funny, I didn't intend to go to Columbine. In fact, yeah, I mean, because I was worried at first and, and um, that it might be contrary to, you know, the, the spirit of, of the initial spirit of the film of, of trying to uh, really show that kids were victimized and then to, to, you know, well, doesn't this defy, you know, that, that vision and then, it, 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 you know, so, um, but, but, you know, I, I, you know, for that reason, you know, to be an honest filmmaker, I, it, it meant I really had to go there and explore more and I'm glad I did because it, you know, because it shows just how victimized, you know, how, yeah, just <laughs> how, how, you know, all students are and, and you know, the consequences of, of these kinds of environments can, you know, can lead to these, these horrible, you know, acts. Um, but it's, um, uh, you know, so, so I, I was just across the street, you know, trying to get some, some footage of the school because you can't be on school property technically or, you know. Uh, and some kids walked up and asked, you know, what I was doing, and I, it's funny because I, I was so used to being defensive, um, you know, because I'd, I'd already been kicked out of, you know, schools before uh, that where I was, you know, talking to kids and they, they got, you know, the, 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 the people at the schools, the administrators got really nervous uh, that, that I was, you know, allowing kids to speak their minds, that I was a school <laughs> the property in the past. So, um, so yeah, so I got all defensive, and then I was like, "Wait a second, this this, this is for them." And so then I just let them talk, and then I turned the cameras on them, and then you know, and then when they understood and saw that, you know, that 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 this was an honest project where I was, you know, really coming from, you know, a, a place that was not, uh, um, you know, that 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 was searching for for real, you know, core truth, uh, and wasn't a propaganda piece. Uh, you know, then then they all jumped on board and got got pretty excited. Yeah, I think more if from the standpoint of a viewer, uh, the simplicity and thoughtfulness of much of what they said uh, had some clarity that that even the more thoughtful adult voices um, couldn't bring couldn't bring the same, to the same level. And it was just sort of, I was, at one point, the kid in the hat, the dork hat, said yeah, something yeah, so yeah. profound. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Stop the press. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, Dan was great. You know, and, and, and you know, his, his family, you know, we kind of, I kind of, I'm still in touch with his, his, his him and his, his family. Uh, he, he became a, a filmmaker. Um, oh. And, uh, and a very good one. And uh, yeah, and and I, I I think I'm responsible for that, and uh, um, and I'm still I'm still in touch with, with his, his his wonderful family, and we adopted one another, and I, you know they're great, and uh, you know they let me follow him around, and it, it's funny because like uh, there's like the great footage of of, <laughs> you know, of him getting up in the morning, you know at six a.m. and he forgot that we were coming by, and he's all groggy and. <laughs> And he makes coffee, <laughs> and all that's real. Nothing, nothing. It was staged. And I guess, I guess there was like McDonald's or something for breakfast. And his, and his mother, I guess, normally makes a meal, and and that's like, and she just cringes whenever that scene comes up because she, she, you know, it's like, 
you know, normally that's not what he eats him for breakfast. You know, she, she's, she's very upset about that being uh, uh, being on camera. It was funny, uh, and uh, but he he he's he is a really he's he's just very insightful and very charismatic and uh, just a smart smart kid and. Uh, uh, and and I I've, I've been trying to work. Yeah, you know, I I had him. I actually worked with him on, on on another you know small project, and I which I intend to to bring him back on because he really did an amazing job uh, at doing some editing for me. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm just happy that that's worked out. But uh, but yeah, he he's he's yeah really would come up with these these great lines. And there's a lot more. I I wanted the film initially to have a lot more. Uh, voices of kids, and I, I kind of regret that it, that it doesn't have more. And it's got some, and, and certainly, and, and it comes it comes out and comes across. But it, it, it was, you know, trying to get the academics and trying to get the kids. It was, you know, mm -hmm. it's a balance. Everything, it's a balancing act, and you know, editing and stuff. But when, whenever the kids come on board, it just, you know, there's just so much energy. Um, I really so enjoyed watching Lori Couture speak because she's going to be a speaker at the conference and I had not heard her before. And yeah. I, again, I thought she did a, a lovely, wonderful yeah. job, but there was yeah. just something so penetrating about the kids. Yeah, well, she's got that, that indignation uh, while still managing to, she, she does that perfect balance of, 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 of outrage, of moral outrage, while sticking to the facts at all times and being able to always, you know, keep things grounded in research and, uh, and yeah, you know, she does. She just you know does this great job with this level-headed, you know, uh, you know, points that she raises. She's, she's really good. It's interesting that you know um, the, the the portions of the movie with Dr. Peter Bregan and, and Laurie, we we're talking about you know the over prescriptions and over, and misuse of ADHD drugs and, and stuff like that. Now there, there's been a couple of articles and research that's come out where. You know, people in the industry are saying, "Yeah, we we think that we've overprescribed. Oh boy, we we think that this has been a big mistake." But you know, I've yet to see anything like like being done to to stop it or read anything that that measures have, have been taken. Are are you aware of anything? I mean, have you been following this since you made the movie? Um, one of the biggest frustrations I had in the movie actually was um, I spent literally years trying to get. A psychiatrist or a drug company to come on board and defend the drugging of kids, and um, you know, I, I mean, I didn't put it in those terms, but right. <laughs> I, I, I'm very careful, you know, in, in, in my outreach uh, to, to to not word it that way, and you know, and no one, would, and, and I think, you know, I, I think that speaks so much as far mm -hmm. as uh, integrity, and that, that that was one thing that I guess really really came across as far as, um, you know, thing, things that I understood. Like, for instance, with, um, and I'm sorry if this is deviating from, from your question. Um, Go ahead. But, uh, but, but, but integrity was, was something that, that, you know, when it, there were a lot of principals and, 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 you know, administrators who had suspended and expelled kids under zero tolerance, and none of them would, would, would appear on camera, except in the South. In the South, I, I you know I, I disagreed with what a lot of these people were doing, but I felt that they at least were you know had integrity. You know they, they thought they were doing it for the right reasons because they were willing to go on camera and and explain themselves and defend themselves. And I respect I respect the integrity of those people. I don't necessarily respect their judgment, but I respect their integrity. I, I feel like the the people who, who would not go on camera. Um, Knew they had bad in judgment and could not defend it and had no integrity. And, and there, I really wanted to out a lot of those people. And, and, and the drug companies, no one would, would talk and no one would even submit a, a statement of any kind. And, and I understand that the hatchet jobs of the crappy documentarians and the Michael Moores who, who make propaganda films but don't actually make documentaries have really made it hard for for you know the handful of us. Uh, that really do take this task seriously and really don't want to make propaganda uh, and get those those other voices uh, because they're worried of how they're going to be portrayed. And I, I, I get that, but at the same time, um, you know, there really there had not never been a theatrically released film on education before this one, and you know because of that, it, it really you know I, I think there was a certain sense of, of, of importance that they. You know that they could have and should have, you know, stepped up. Um, 
But, oh, yeah, well, one of the things, I guess, related to that, which was kind of funny, was uh, had to do with No Child Left Behind. I kept going to the Department of Education, pleading them with or someone who would just go on camera and talk and defend, you know, No Child Left Behind, anyone, please, you know? Uh, and it was so hard to get these contrary points of view. And finally, wow. after, after a couple of years of just harassing them, I don't want to say harassing, but of, of, mm -hmm. of, of, of you know, cajoling them, of trying... They finally referred me to this one person who was the head of uh, Excellent Education for Everyone. And, and he was based in New Jersey, so we went down and talked to this guy and, you know, started asking him some questions. And this was, and all the filming, the principal filming had been done. This was just kind of, you know, okay, we're done with filming, but okay, we have to do this interview because, um, you know, because this is something we've been trying to get for a while. So he, so, but, but, it, but, but I went into a, you know, just trying to, you know, it was, it was more of a mission to get some sound bites supporting, you know, No Child Left Behind. So I did it, and it wasn't quite the same spirit as some of the other interviews where, where it was, you know, meandering road, seeing where it would lead me. So I'm talking to him, and he's, he's, you know, criticizing and putting down No Child Left Behind. And, and I, and I did something I'd never really done before. About, you know, ten minutes into, I was like, wait, wait a second. You know, I never interrupted. I never, you know, would stop a flow. And I was just like, wait a second. The Department of Education, you know, told us to interview you because you were going to defend No Child Left Behind. And he said, oh, you won't find a single educated person who knows anything about this who's going to defend No Child Left Behind. <laughs> 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 and this, this person was recommended by the Department of Education. Oh. Uh, um, uh. uh, I'm trying to remember what your question was about drugging. Uh, um, <laughs> that's a great story, though. I, lack I, of I, advice. I, wow. Yeah, I, I think it's it's become so. I, I think part of the problem with that is um, so many parents, you know, have have gone on board and have have given their kids these medications and drugs, and to suddenly tell parents who had to make this really difficult choice, difficult decision that. Whoops, we were wrong. You know, that's, uh, you know the, the, the lack of faith in, in the drug companies and, and the psychiatrists and you know who, who's ever been prescribing these things is, is would be would be awfully severe. It's it's mm -hmm. you know I, I yeah I, I, I suspect and that's just one theory you know that that you know could be a component as to why um, you know it's because you, you do have a lot of people the parents had to get on board at some point. And, so yeah, this is this is the right thing to do. I you know because uh, I'm sure I'm sure no no caring parent wants to you know put their kids on on medication if they don't have to. And so they really had to be you know buy into a certain bill of sales. There was a, an, an interesting uh, op-ed in the New York Times the other day by a South Korean teacher writing about you know how nasty the uh, South Korean school system is yeah, and how. Did you read that by any chance? Yeah, I did read that. Yeah, and and I was I was really struck by um you know you know the arguments that she was making because they sound so similar to the ones that that obviously we've been making for years. But you know it seems like we're we're like like despite you know our, our the the best educators you know getting behind programs like No Child Left Behind and then not doing anything when they realize it's not it's not really working. I just let it go along. It kind of worries me that we're going to turn into South Korea. That that that's the end game of of all this, you know, war on kids. Yeah, I I mean, it's we already are there. I mean, it's it's. I mean, yeah. Granted, and conceitedly, it's 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 uh, uh, you know, it's you know more severe. It's you know the American system on crack, but it's still the American <laughs> system. Uh, yeah. It's more extreme. We'll never become like that because you know there there is a certain you know, culture, uh, you know, <laughs> there, you know, the component to 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 that kind of of, of approach, and um, and 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 that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. You know, I mean, it's bad in certainly the outcome, but the the cultural components uh, right. that create that kind of thing. I think a lot of it is uh, there is much greater an active involvement in the lives of children in South Korea than there is in, in, in America. And so, you know, that is positive, but, you know, but when you add school into the mix, it becomes negative. Right. Um, 
So, I was really, really surprised that one of her recommendations, which was to, to rein in the private education industry, claiming that it's it's fanning in, you know, fears of inferiority among the parents about their children at incredible rates. And, you know, I mean, I see that sort of stuff in American advertising about, oh, your kids will, will learn, you know, like with baby Einstein and these things. You know, you, they'll, they'll get smarter if they use these products. But I guess in, in South Korea, like it goes all the way to college, is this push to use these products or use these services, or else you will be inferior. And you know, I, I kind of see that, like in, in again, to go back to the drug issue, like you know, these drugs will make you perform better in school and so on. Is, is do you do you find that since you made the film that 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 there is even more of a push to like make kids do well in school? Regardless of the cost or the, to them, in terms of you know physical or in terms of actually purchasing things and like getting stuck with a tutor for three years, it's more like a personal trainer and stuff like like that. Um, actually, ironically, I think there's been a decrease. You know, and you know from from oh. the to there used to be. You know, I think that the peak of helicopter parenting, which is I guess what they, they call it or used to call it. Um, was was right around that time, and, and you know, from, mm -hmm. from the educators and people I've spoken to, that that seems to have uh, have diminished. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I think I think uh, a lot of what you're describing though is more of a function of capitalism, and yeah, uh, you know, more than you know, and, and again, it's you know, just just applying it to schools. I mean, if uh, if you know, when, when fax machines or copy machines first came out, you know, the business that had the copy machine was, you know, superior. You know, they didn't have to use the carbon copy. But then everyone gets a copy machine. And then, if you, you know, then everyone's the same. But if you don't have a copy machine, you know, you're screwed. Uh, and then, you know, whatever the next piece of technology. So as, as you, know, uh, you know, websites, computer integrated, you know, all, all the different things, you know, that, that, that come, come about are... You know, are are they advancements, or are they just a matter of you know of, of you know if if you don't have it, you fall behind, as opposed to you're not actually really getting ahead. Uh, and, and so I, I think one can look at the South Korean system as as a means of you know of of applying you know students, where each student is basically their own corporation. Right. Uh, but but there is there is a there is a response to that. And you know, if if one decides to be creative and think outside the box, and that is always looking at what's what's the end game. Well, if the end game is uh, you know most likely it's going to be financial success. So it's going to be well, what's going to make you the most uh, employable person, and is the, the most employable person the person who has you know the highest grades or highest numbers, or is the most employable person the person who excels most at the skills that businesses actually need? Mm -hmm. and so if you actually go to businesses and you say, hey, I can give you a person who's got, you know, a 4.0 GPA, or I can give you someone who actually excels at, you know, creativity and, you know, and, and has all these different, you know, and, and is, is, is self-motivated uh, and, and, and a gifted writer and, you know, can do all, the, all these different things. You know, who do you want? The person, you know, who, who's got this number that's been, you know, yes, rubber stamped by, by a school system or, or a person who actually has the skills. Right. Well, you know, any, you know, a business that's successful will, will know right away, oh, of course I want the person who has the skills, you know, mm -hmm. you know screw the, uh, you know, whatever the, the, the school. <laughs> I mean, I've hired, you know, I've hired 100 people and only, you know, 15 of them have turned out to be qualified, even though they all are, you know, the valedictorians of their respective, you know, <laughs> schools. So, you know, it's, I, I think it, it becomes, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, so that would be, you know, one, one approach. It's, it's sort of thinking of, of actually fulfilling, you know, what are the needs of society as opposed to, you know, what is, you know, what is school actually certifying. Right. <laughs> that is the thing. Hey Kevin, I want to springboard off the, the pharmaceutical discussion uh, just prior and and kind of bring this out to the larger societal. So uh, in the same way that we sort of look at the, the drugging of kids, I think we're looking at the food industry and uh, sort of the tobacco of our day, right? The kind of additives and the things that are being sold as food and obesity. I think we're looking at the banking industry. I think we're looking at governance. Um, both Matt Hearn in the hour previous and Herman Doing, I think, kind of take school and, and use it to 
to show that it's just one manifestation of a larger societal problem, sort of an institutional illich kind of a uh, problem. Do you agree with that? Do you feel like uh, th th this is just a, a parallel to the ways in which other institutions operate in our cultures? Um, I, I think school is a little different. And the reason why I think it's different is, is because I think that schooling creates a paradigm that enables all of the other dysfunctional institutions to, to exist. You know, if you look at the corrupt banking, well, you know, how, how does something like that happen? Well, it, it happens, you know, because people lack empathy and, and they don't think of themselves as being part of a community. And, and where does that come from? Well, I, I'd say that that comes from being in school. I think schooling, you know, will, will crush, uh, you know, it, it actively destroys any sense of, of communal responsibility. You, you don't know your, your, your neighbor next door, and, and you don't have those kinds of obligations, responsibilities, because you've abdicated them to the school. You've said, you know, the school is the one who's responsible for, for you know, for, as, as the social center of, of the community and for, for mediating how, uh, you know, how, how we relate to one another. And, you know, what is that environment that, that's, you know, taking that control? It's an, it's an autocratic environment that, uh, you know, governs through social efficiency and has no interest in, in the individuals that, that constitute, you know, the, uh, you know, the institution, uh, that comprise the institution. So, um, so I, I think, it, I think the, the corruption of schooling is so much more fundamental uh, because, like I said, it, it enables uh, the, the, the dysfunction in, in, in other realms. Mm -hmm. Gatto kind of says that that's by design. Or at least that the outcome is so beneficial that no one wants to change it because it does so, so well serve the manufacturers who like people all buy the same thing that can compliant people. I, I don't subscribe to that. I, I, I love Gatto. I think he's, he's, he's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. He's one of the most creative minds that I've, uh, that I've met. Um, but I, I don't buy into the conspiracy um, component. I, I just... I don't think people are, are you know that well organized or that well you know that really you know do that kind of planning. I, I think you know it's it's sort of a, a lowest common denominator, lazy kind of thing, and it's it's just such a lazy system to you know mm -hmm. to sort of abdicate control to, to something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I just think bad outcomes come you know as as a result of mm -hmm. uh, you know sort of the you know the, the result of the, of the creation of the bureaucracy. And when you have people who are part of it who, who really, honestly, genuinely believe that they are doing good, um, mm -hmm. and they they support this, you know, those are the teachers and teachers, mm -hmm. you know, most teachers. And I, I didn't expect that going into the film. That was one surprise. I, I didn't realize how many teachers were earnest, um, you know, because of my experience as a student. They they were, you know, it's it was, you know, an us versus them kind of thing. But but many of them really are genuinely earnest. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. It's not that earnest people can't be part of a conspiracy unwittingly. You know, we certainly you know can and have seen that kind of thing happen. But but you know who who are the people at the top? And you know it's it's mm. I, I I just can't really buy into that. I I just think that you know bad things can happen in terms of creating a bad system, and it's just um, irresponsible. Okay, I, I want to play the Gatto advocate here. So this is really interesting to me, right? Because I felt like that moment when uh, Artie Duncan was coming out with education policy that was almost the opposite of what President Obama said he wanted for his own kids in the Quaker school in Washington, you know, <laughs> indicated an understanding that there's a difference between how they want elite children to be educated and how they want the mass of kids to be educated. I don't know that you have to call that a conspiracy, but it does seem to me that there's a recognition that there is a way of treating the, the greater public body versus how you would educate an elite student in a private school. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, again, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's conspiracy. I, I, it's like, um, uh, you know, it's like first class seating on an airline. And... Um, you know, it's it's. I, I would say that that they don't really think of 
private schools is necessarily, um, uh, you know that that you know that, that I, I I believe that that these that, that the Arnie Duncans genuinely believe that uh, you know that that pe that anyone who goes through the public school system has the capacity to uh, um, you know uh, be successful in in some kind of way. Although that's that's a whole other issue as far as how success is defined. And, and that's a whole other corruption uh, that takes that takes place, and that's you know a lot of you know the uh, the education writers are, are guilty of that too. But um, that's a whole other issue right now. I I, I yeah I, I think that's that confusing elitism of uh, you know the, the the people who go to private school with conspiracy is is kind of a different thing. I think that's just sort of you know the the rewards one gets for for power and wealth as opposed to being a means of 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 keeping the masses down mm. yeah but okay what are the uh what are the we've only got about ten minutes left uh, pat i'll I'll ask the next one and then I'll cede the time to you uh, it felt like through the film there was this unspoken theme or a theme I kept thinking of which was it felt like the schools were creating the very problems they said they were solving, mm -hmm. right? The use of control and uh, uh, the institutional um, programs were actually creating the problems. Did I read too much into that, or did you did you come away with the same feeling? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I can't even you know that that just nails it on the head. I can't even add anything more to that sentiment. That's precisely correct. <laughs> That was too easy. Four <laughs> speed. <laughs> well, it, you know, to, to go back to the, the conspiracy thing, the more I think about that, the more I, I, I just keep coming back to this term rent seeking. You know, and it seems like, you know, we, we mentioned those judges in Pennsylvania who were taking kickbacks because every child represented what, seven thousand dollars? And so they were able to send them away to a reform school and get a kickback from that seven thousand dollars, you know, with with the school. And you know, certainly there's a lot of people that don't want the school system to change just because it's comfortable for them and their livings, you know. Um, and and why upset set that apple cart? Um, I mean, I, to me, to me, there's just this complacency that that you've identified, and and I think that it's really. Um, Hard for people to to see that because there's so much self-interest, and you know it's it's like you want the school to go for, as you said because you have that that the the judgment of not the judgment but the the mission of caring for the children, and so once once you you you've enshrined it in that it's very hard to criticize and then it's very hard to to change like oh I'm doing this for the kids if we don't do this. Well, there was a story in the New Yorker about the school in Georgia, um, and that was the whole sentiment of why they, they did this mass cheating on this test, because they, they knew their kids wouldn't pass and the school would be closed. So the small group of teachers said, oh, we're going to save these kids, and they did all this mass cheating. The, to me, that was a perfect example of an institution creating a problem it's meant to solve. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I, just, I wrote a piece for Healthy Living magazine that should be coming out pretty shortly. Uh, about why cheating is a moral imperative, um, or cheating in school is a moral imperative. Ah, yeah. Uh, you know, when when you subject a population to you know to to an environment that they did not you know choose to to be a part of, and there are consequences for their behavior. Um, you know, it's it's, mm -hmm. it's completely necessary and justified. You know, I, I realize you're talk not talking about the students cheating, but it's the same thing. You know, right. Anyone who who doesn't, you know, do whatever they can to undermine the system uh, for their own benefit is is foolish, uh, mm -hmm. because you know the system is not there for their benefit. It's not looking after their interests. What do you think about all these efforts to disrupt education? Doesn't it seem a little presumptuous to say I'm going to go in and disrupt something? Is that really how this is supposed to happen? <laughs> I, I don't know. You, you know, I guess you have to define what you mean by disruption because I'm in the process. Uh of, writing, yeah. of completing this, you know, wholesale revision of my of a student resistance handbook, whose, whose mission is 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 aggressive and active disruption of of, of you know schools, you know, ah. with, with the intent of of making them you know completely you know, un, untenable. 
Right. Well, that that to me is disruption. That makes sense. I mean, what, what I often get when I read about like you know the class classroom disruption, education disruption, it's like, oh, now we're we're going to use iPads, <laughs> you know, or we're going to do the flipped classroom. You know, these are the things that they claim are disrupting it. And I and I think that when you look at the war on kids, there are so many more <laughs> important and, and truly disturbing disruptive things that that, that are happening. Yet we, we seem to ignore that and focus on these other things. Um, it's I, I really like how, how your movie brought that out. And, and do you do you have plans on doing a, another film on education? Well, I, I've been trying for a while now to to sell. Uh, I, ha I have an idea for for a series. Uh, so it's you know the half hour episodes uh, where each um, uh, each episode deals empirically. With uh, some, you know, some some component of a uh, facet of, of education, uh, but the problem is broadcasters don't really like empirical analysis. They want human stories of you know of, of an individual person anecdotally going through life, mm -hmm. you know, that will be treated as if it's empirical, even though it, it isn't. Um, and uh, but it, but there there have been some broadcasters that said you know. If I make it, that they'll air it. Um, so I'm, I'm wrapping up a few other projects, and, and we'll be mm -hmm. working on that. And it will be uh, um, it will be important, and it will be um, you know controversial, and it, and it will be uh, powerful, and it will be true. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds great. I look forward to seeing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so that is. You know that 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 will take place. I just have to. I've just I've got three other film projects that I'm wrapping up right now on mm -hmm. various stages of production. Well, two in post, ones in just entering production. But once mm -hmm. once those are done, I'll be I'll be working on the education series, and I'm excited. And and and, and I'm certain you'll be involved in some capacity. So. Oh wow! Well, thank you. <laughs> That'll be fun. <laughs> hey Kevin, I'm really interested in maybe we can kind of wrap up here in the role of. Uh, inexpensive grassroots documentary making and mm. social change. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in a, a comment you made earlier in the interview about the difference between propaganda and uh, sort of an investigative documentary. And what I'm, I would want you to use the ter give us the term for that. But what is the difference, and what and what do you see as being really important to support and promote in this era where filming is becoming a, a much more significant Avenue of social critique. Um, well, the difference between propaganda and, and you know, as far as from 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 a proper documentary filmmaking from from a practical standpoint is the the, the propagandists, which grossly outnumber um, the the honest filmmakers, uh, are the ones who, who go in knowing exactly what they are going to make a film on. Um, I, I had a vision for what I thought the film was going to be on, uh, and you know and the film initially was was going to be called uh, the Worst Generation uh, because there there had been all these you know books out about bashing kids and I think there was even a book you know that later that came out but you know something that was some indictment of youth and and uh, but but the the takeaway was that the, the Worst Generation was actually the baby boomers because they're the ones who had fought so hard for civil rights and then so aggressively took it away and created, you know, just these impressively uh, autocratic and, uh, environments. Uh, the problem was the people that I interviewed were honest academics and they knew better than to indict a generation. You don't do that. You invite, you know, they're, they're individuals who do policies. They're, you know, they're people it's just dishonest to, to just, you know, blanket, you know, attack, you know, target a, a generation. It doesn't, it's not really meaningful. Uh, so I, you know, went along and followed, you know, the people that, that I was talking to and, you know, and, and found the story. And, and, and initially, um, you know, I, I came into the film thinking, you know, yeah, the schools, schools have problems, but, you know, you can, you can fix them, you can reform them. I, I didn't realize that schools could not be reformed. This was you know, something, a conclusion that came out of, of, of my making the film. I didn't realize that the problems with school was, was the construct, was, was how schools are, are designed and defined, and so you, you can't reform it because that's just the nature of what it is. Uh, and I followed all those leads, and this is, you know, that's, 
you know, I did my best to, to be honest as far as, you know, portraying the outcome of, of, of this genuine research. Uh, you know, you got Waiting for Superman, for instance. That's just pure propaganda. You know, the guy came in, he, he's, you know, got either, you know, either he personally has, you know, money in charter schools or, or something, and he comes out with this you know, incredibly dishonest movie, you know, that's just there to celebrate charter schools. And, um, you know, it's it's propaganda. It's it's not it's not done with any pursuit of truth, and it's there with an agenda uh, that that preempted the the act of, of making the movie in the first place. Um, much to my dismay, I would say the propagandists have the edge because mm -hmm. their message is usually uh, it's usually very simple. It's very straightforward. Uh, people challenge, you know, what I made because they say, oh, you didn't, you know, provide a solution, you know, where's the answer and, and stuff because they wanted to be spoon-fed an answer. And, and I very deliberately didn't even go there. In fact, there was an early edit where there was one mention where one person had, you know, had uttered the word homeschool. And uh, this one at a, at a pre-screen, there was this one, you know, journalist from Columbia University who was there who said that the film was, was a whole you know, uh, basically, you know, propagandistic piece for homeschooling. So I, I, I edited out that one reference to homeschooling just, just to, you know, for, you know, idiots like that. And, uh, you know, really deliberately, because once you, if you try to make something where, where you offer a solution, you know, even, even if, you know, your mountain of evidence for why something's bad, if you offer a solution, people are going to find, you know, and, and if the, the solution is, is phenomenal, there's always going to be, you know, you can't have, there's no such thing as a perfect solution. So people are going to find the one tiny little flaw that you have, and they're going to say, oh, we should stay with the status quo. So I wanted to avoid that altogether. So that's why I was like, you know, there's no way I'm going to even, I'm not going to take that data. I'm not going to offer any solutions. I'm just going to show that, that there are, you know, <laughs> intrinsic problems that can't be fixed and, you know, leave it to, you know, to, to, you know, others to, to find what works best for them, but as long as the message is out, you know, that this is not workable and that this is not moral and this is not tenable, you know, that that's the message that people should come across with and people should go, oh, what can I do about this? You know, this is, this is, I'm, I'm, this is torture. This is, this is, you know, this is, you know, human rights violation to send my, my kids, you know, to, to these places. And, you know, it's incumbent on them to, to then, you know, figure out how to respond. You know, naturally want to be spoon fed, but uh, that, you know, I'm not. I'm not doing that. Um, but the the propagandists, you know, they'll sell the snake oil. They'll give you the simple solution. They'll give you the sound bite. They'll, they'll, they'll they're whores. You know, they'll, they'll give you whatever you want because they're they're not interested in 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 you know what what's best. They're just interested in you know, promoting themselves and promoting you know their you know their projects. Nice job, Kevin. Well said. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, it was great talking with you. Yeah, awesome talking with you guys. Yeah, yeah. taking the time. Yeah. Thanks for the film. Thank you. Yeah, and I hope many people watch it. I, I know that I, I tweeted it. I tweeted your password today, so <laughs> hopefully you got a big hit. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it was eight years in the making that movie. I, I, I know, did, right? I did love, and I didn't think, you know, I, I, I yeah. <laughs> I, I had no idea that other movies in education were going to come out after that one. It was just a whole lot, and I, I didn't feel like I was racing against time because no one, you know, no one else, you know, was really making any movies in education. Hmm. So, well, thanks for being here. Yeah. Look forward to the next one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Good night. Good night, <laughs> Good night everybody. <laughs> Bye.